It is Monday, May 14th, 2018, and this is the Monday Morning Analyst. Welcome everyone, my name is Luke Thomas, I'm the host of this podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. A lot of action happened over the weekend. Lomachenko fought on the boxing side, there was Bellator 199, UFC 224, and we are going to look at some of that action, the back take and ultimate submission that was scored by Davi Hamosh in the Nick Hine fight. That was just incredible, so we'll definitely take a look at that. But we have to spend this podcast talking about really the most important issue that came out of the weekend. I don't mean to detract from some of the really great fights that happened and some of the fighters that might deserve attention, but the issue with Raquel Pennington going out to that fifth round. Some of this was covered on my post-fight show that I did with Jed Mishu. You can check that out up here. I'll post it there. But there's a lot more to the story because on Saturday night, most people that I saw came out in protest of what had happened. And then as time went on, people spoke up, including people who have very good credentials inside the sport, uh, much better than me in certain capacities, certainly, uh, were saying things that, that they believe this was a, at, at best, debatable, that they, you know, it wasn't terrible, certainly debatable, maybe even a good call uh, made by her corner. So here's what I want to do today. I tried to inventory the either the best or the most common arguments that I saw in favor of sending Raquel Pennington out to that fifth round uh, in the Amanda Nunes fight, right after she says she's done, that she wanted to be done. Her corner talks her back into it, and she goes back out there and gets uh, brutally finished. All right. So, what are the arguments in favor of that? I'm going to examine them, and I'm going to show you piece by piece why all of them are not good. In fact, I would say most of them are bankrupt. At best, they are dubious. There is no strong argument for sending Raquel Pennington out in that fifth round. There are five basic arguments in favor of allowing Pennington to go out there and do what she did and allowed to happen to her, what happened to her. There are more arguments than that, but there are five sort of core arguments. Now, the first two are kind of connected. I'm going to separate them a little bit, but I'll put them together as well here as I go through them. Let's start with the first one. The first one is that her coaches know her better. I'm really not clear about what this is supposed to mean. I think the idea is that, well, because they have a special relationship with said fighter, whether it's Pennington or any fighter, that the coaches are in a position to make a more informed choice about what should or shouldn't happen to her. But this is total nonsense. It is true, of course, that any corner that's coaching a fighter, and if they're training partners or coaches together or um, whatever the relationship is inside that gym, yes, they clearly do know either Pennington or any other fighter, better than us observers on the outside. But my response would be, that's pretty much not the point. Number one, there's a basic problem with this argument, and it's the appeal from authority, right? We're in a position to have this relationship. You don't understand my relationship to this person. Um, because I have this relationship to this person, I'm in a position to say something. You on the outside, you're not. But that has nothing to do with whether or not that decision is correct. Your position relative to that person does not confer upon you the ability to always make good choices. Yes, you certainly know that person better. And again, I'm not picking on the coaches per se in this context because I see this pervasive in MMA. So let me sort of change the way I frame this. Yes, coaches know their fighters better than the you know, average person sitting in the audience, but that does not confer upon them infallibility. It might make it a little bit less likely that they make a bad choice for their health or could make it more likely depending on their the way in which they coach, the way in which they corner, the way in which they view um, the dignity of taking a beating, which we'll get to later. It's the, it's the appeal to authority, and it's not a very strong argument. Number two, you saw Pris, uh, Priscilla Cachuera after she took that savage beating from the hands of Valentina Shevchenko and that not great job of officiating by Mario Masaki go out and defend the relationship as well. Here's the point. Even in egregious cases, um, what will happen is the fighter and then the team will use that to circle the wagons and insulate themselves from any kind of criticism. Well, you're not on the inside, you're on the outside. Right, that's true. What does that have to do with the decision that was made? You have to defend the decision Per the terms of the decision, the nature of the relationship can be exonerating depending on extra factors that are included, but simply saying that there's a relationship there and saying that that makes the choices that are made as a consequence of that relationship above reproach is not true. Moreover, it can also be the case that somebody can have strong affection, respect, 
uh, could be have high integrity as a person. Like I don't think Pennington's coaches and corners are bad people. Far from it. I think they made that choice in their minds anyway in good faith, but it can also work the opposite. You can push someone to a position where they don't need to be because you know how tough that person is. They know how strong that person is. They know what kind of uh, abilities that, that, that fighter might have, and they might wrongfully assume that by pushing them, they can take them to a place where um, miracles happen and you can get somebody really hurt that way. So it actually works both ways. It's a bad argument just to begin with because it's a way to simply shield themselves from any kind of criticism. It's an appeal to authority, which by itself is just not a strong argument. And number three, it can actually work backwards because then somebody can get actually extra hurt because of that strong, maybe almost irrational belief in the power of somebody who you really care about. That leads to the second argument, which is that, well, not only do you not know about this relationship that these corner and fighter might have, which we've already discussed, but rather maybe this person needs that in training. I've heard that a lot. Boy, I find that incredibly hard to believe for a lot of reasons. Number one, we've already talked about uh, the appeal to authority and why that argument is bankrupt. Um, number two, I would invoke here again Hitchens' razor. An argument made without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. We'll see what the corner has to say. Is it really true that this person habitually has issues committing to the exercise? Not Again, not to exercise as in the act of fitness preparation. No, no, no. But about fighting itself, that they need to be talked into it? I find that very hard to believe. There is a clear and unequivocal distinction between a coach motivating somebody in training to finish that last rep, to really do that weight cutting to completion, and somebody in the throes of a crisis, an existential crisis, which is exactly what that is, in a moment of a fight, saying they are not interested in participating in this experience anymore cajoling them and trying to get them back into it. Those are separate. That's not a difference in degree. That's a difference in kind. Moreover, think about who elite fighters are. This doesn't even match at all Raquel Pennington's character. In fact, her character is exactly the opposite. Have you noticed, outside of being submitted by Zingano, and being submitted in jiu-jitsu is almost more of a strategic surrender than it is an emotional or uh, spiritual one. Um, have you ever seen her quit? She is known for being durable. She is known for being tough. She's known for gutting it out hard in fights late. In fact, this is the first time I think I've ever seen anything like this. She's had some wins. She's had some losses. But that doesn't match what appears to be her character in professional competition at all. And again, I've seen fighters need pushing through that last strength and conditioning session or, you know, again, weight cutting. They might need some motivation in that regard. But that's not the same as a moment where somebody is psychically, strategically, and physically surrendering and asking for help and asking for a lifeline. Folks have said, well, why didn't she go ask the ref? Uh, why didn't she just go tell the ref? Yes, some fighters will do that. They'll be so cognizant that they're done that they, they will go and absolutely do that. But not all of them will. This is why the corner's position here is no longer as let me be the same kind of coach that I was in a strength and conditioning session or a weight cutting session. Their job is to soberly assess the situation, decide if this person can compete, can ha has a reasonable chance of winning, and then make a call. And if a fighter is telling them not only do they think they can't win, they don't even want to try, pushing them through like this is some finish the last you know, set of planks and then sprints in the gym is is getting the, the situation totally confused. So you have a really bad argument from authority. You have Hitchens razor invoked. You have this confusing role of coaching being brought into cornering. I have news for everyone. Coaching is not the same as cornering. They are two different exercises. Cornering is something unto itself. It is a skill. It is a responsibility. It is something you get licensed to do. You don't simply say, oh, I'm a fighter, I'm going to have this person and that person and that person corner me. They have to apply to have that. And I'm sure that the rules in some states are quite lax, but nevertheless, it reflects upon the responsibility there. Their job is to put their fighter in the best position they can to win, as well as to look out for their health and safety. In looking at this scenario, weighing the situation where there was this unequivocal gap between them for 20 minutes, a fighter who is and deservedly, reputationally known as somebody who is incredibly tough, turns and says, I've had enough. I'm done. I want to be done. 
it, it's not strength and conditioning times at, at, at noon on Tuesdays. Um, it's a very different responsibility. It's a very different scenario. And I think there's a lot of confusion about what the role is there. You're, you can be a coach in some kind of abstract sense, but in that moment, you're a corner. The job is provide strategy, provide tactics, to some degree, if they're wavering a little bit, providing motivation. But the question is, is saying I'm done wavering, it's the opposite of wavering. It is absolutely crossing a line, a sacred one, which we'll talk a little bit later. At that point, you have a responsibility to look out for their health and safety. That's why that situation is different. A third argument I saw was, well, the damage wasn't that bad. Maybe the coaches realized, sure, she was in a tough spot, but the damage wasn't that bad, so... They wanted to talk her back into it. I, I, I don't understand this argument uh, either. Number one, I'm a little bit hesitant to make a sweeping generalization about how bad the damage was. It did not necessarily look all that bad from the outside looking in, but for somebody who is known as being very, very tough, for her to say, mm, uh, this was not exactly a pleasant scenario for me and I didn't want to participate anymore, there's a reason to listen to that. Moreover, that doesn't have to be the scenario. The scenario is not that the damage has to be so bad that the person then calling out, well, that's a scenario where you then go and protect them. The question is consent to the activity. The question is the degree to which they are interested in participating in this anymore. The question is to what extent by having them go back out there when their participation and their willingness to participate is either wavering or compromised to the point where um, it is barely there anymore, they're going to go out there and get hurt, which is exactly what happened. I keep seeing these scenarios like, well, the damage wasn't that bad. First of all, the damage ended up being quite bad. She couldn't even go to the post-fight press conference. I'd say that's pretty bad. But more to the point, it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. What if somebody took one shot and they didn't want it anymore? That's okay. That's the right that that fighter has. That's the ability that fighter has to say, I don't really want to participate in this scenario anymore. There is no threshold of damage beyond which we can say, well, once someone has an eye flap hanging and a broken arm, well... Well, then you can say that they're in a position to say they don't want it anymore. They're in a position to say that whenever they want. Whenever they want. At any point, at any time, for any reason, they are allowed to say that. And once they do, it should be listened to and it should be obeyed. It should be, it should be taken, as I mentioned before, and I'll explain why in a minute, as sacred. But this notion about, like, well, the first four rounds, the damage wasn't so bad. And? It's got nothing to do with the scenario. The scenario was whether or not a person is consenting to this activity. A person is emotionally invested in a way where they're not giving themselves a chance to win and they're not going to get overly damaged. And you saw the exact opposite of that happened. It was clear that once she went back out for that fifth, from a participatory standpoint, she just wasn't all there anymore. And that's when the damage went and got really bad. Another argument you commonly see is that the fighter will later decide that they were thankful that the corner did that for them. And so, therefore, the decision was ultimately justified. I don't like this argument either. I don't find it to be particularly compelling for a couple of reasons. The first of which is you see this all the time, even in egregious cases. I mentioned the Priscilla Cachuera. Now, that's not one where, well, her corner could have done her a favor, but it's a little more complicated because the referee had a responsibility there as well. But you get the idea. After the fight was over, she was saying, you don't understand the relationship, which we talked about before, and she had no problems with it. The fighter will very, very rarely ever go back and say, well, the corner did me dirty. It would take serial abuse for people that tough and that bonded for them to go back and say something was amiss. So to me, I don't really understand this argument as some kind of end-all, be-all. At the moment they were there, they were clearly in distress and they were looking for a lifeline and they didn't get it. And in the moment of stress like that, in a moment of, frankly, surrender like that, to not be listened to is abhorrent. And you can say, well, then why wouldn't you listen to them after the fact? right? Because we're, what we're doing is we're evaluating that decision for its merits, which we're going through. I understand the fighter afterwards might rethink it. I understand the fighter afterwards might say, eh, well, it wasn't so bad. Here's the problem with that argument on top of it. You don't know once you send that fighter in a compromised state back out there what's going to happen. I am telling you now in MMA, here is what is going to happen. There is... There are well-intentioned people, and I'll say it before and I'll say it again. I do believe that Pennington's Corner are good, well-intentioned people. I think they made a very bad choice, but I don't think that they're bad people. But when good people don't recognize bad situations and we don't have this culture change that we desperately need, 
it is great when a fighter afterwards comes out and says, hey, that's not so bad. What about the fighters who don't have that opportunity anymore? And what I mean is, it is great that Raquel Pennington will probably be okay, and, and I wish her and her team well. I'm sure she'll get back to her winning ways once she gets a chance to heal, compete, and get a new fight, and that's good news. The truth of the matter is, we are waiting, and you should mark my words now, because of the prevailing attitudes in MMA, we are waiting for a catastrophic injury, or worse, to happen before we have a reformation of cornering practices. I don't presume that in putting this video out, I'm going to change a bunch of opinions. I don't think that's true at all. I am not, I am not so stupid as to believe that. What I do think is true is that there are people raising the alarm bells about what's going to happen if something doesn't change. Thank God nothing happened here. I am very delighted to see that in the Priscilla Cachuera fight, in, in Don Cerrone being sent back out against Jorge Masvidal, and many other scenarios as well. Good, coach, good coaches, good corners, people who mean well, they can make bad choices. But because there is this acceptance of it, the only way it appears to me that anything is going to change is not debate like this, although it can be helpful. I am very frightened that we are going to wait until something absolutely catastrophic happens before we wake up and realize if a fighter it looks to be in a compromised state or ex says in that moment they are in a compromised state and we don't listen to them, something terrible is going to happen and I do not want to get to that point. So it's great that fighters after the fact can rethink things that has nothing to do with whether or not that a situation was appropriate there and worse, we're not going to get better coaching and cornering, excuse me, not coaching, we're not going to get better cornering generally, it appears, with these kinds of attitudes out there until something catastrophic happens. And I hope it never does, and I hope maybe I, people can just have this debate on Twitter, and that'll be the end of it. But I fear that if we don't change practices, we are inexorably hurtling towards that very, very scary future. I've seen the argument that allowing her to go into the fifth round was one that conferred dignity upon her, right? It allowed her to lose with dignity. No, she would have lost with dignity no matter what. To suggest that dignity would have been erased had she decided to call it quits in the fourth seems to me totally backwards and barbaric. George St. Pierre quit when he was getting bombed on from Matt Sarah. If you would have looked him in the face and said, you don't have dignity for quitting, um, I don't know what kind of way in which you think dig dignity exists or how it is conferred. It seems barbaric. To look at that. Moreover, he had this redemption opportunity long after that, and no one even talks about the fact that he tapped to strikes uh, in a moment of uh, a dire situation. He saved himself an extra amount of damage, he saved himself a beating, and he came back and won. Now, I recognize that Raquel Pennington has not, even up to that point, had not had the career George St. Pierre did. Would she ever be back in the title fight? And to what extent are health and safety rules? Is there a sliding scale between non title fights and title fights? That's a debate we can have, although I think that the folks who say that in a title fight, when the stakes are higher, we should have less regard for health and safety, should be forced to flesh out that position a little bit, because I'm not sure that I understand it, especially in a situation where the fighter was unequivocal, that they did not want to compete anymore, and they were cajoled back into it. So there's that. But I do recognize in the community that there are just these really weird attitudes about how dignity is conferred, and, and I recognize that when you're in those situations, and I'm not, that the pressure upon you to act in a certain way might be a little bit different. Gilbert Melendez wanted out against Jeremy Stevens. He was talked back into it, and all he got for it was, I guess he feels like he got his dignity um, and an extra beating. But here's the reality of that. The, what, what underpins that is this belief that we have in MMA where we valorize taking a beating. right? What's better, to not take a beating and call it a day, or to take a beating... Um, and then just to march through it and stand up on your feet when it's over. There are going to be some people that say taking that beating is worth it. And there is something to be said through pushing yourself through your limits. There is something to be said for pushing yourself through your comfort zones. But when you're a professional and you have a finite amount of damage you can take over the course of your career, there is a zero-sum game with this one a little bit. Just electing to take a beating when you don't need to is at a at, a, at the very best not a very smart or pragmatic decision. If you believe it confers upon you honor, I suppose, but again, it's that kind of attitude going forward unless some kind of major reformation happens that's going to get somebody very, very catastrophically injured or worse. We are enabling people to take damage when they don't need to by valorizing something that does not need to be valorized. I know 
Ra- uh, Raquel Pennington is tough. I may not know her personally. We're not best friends. Uh, I've interviewed her maybe a, one or two times ever. Um, but I know she's tough. Her record of achievement is clear. And I know she is talented. Her record of achievement is clear. The notion that by calling it uh, a day in a fight where there was never really any moment she had uh, uh, not only clear offense but clear winning uh, and was in tremendous probably discomfort and only paid for that with extra damage on top of that, uh, she didn't lose any dignity with me and she wouldn't have. And I don't know how taking an extra beating confers upon her dignity other than when you say, well, there is valor in, in taking unnecessary damage. No, no, there is not. Why does this keep happening? As I mentioned, we valorize taking a beating. Number two, we have an inflated sense about the extent to which somebody can win. I realize that last-minute subs happen, and I realize that last-minute knockouts happen. But the reality is we have this weird feeling in MMA that because they can happen, that they we, we should just entertain all situations where they might. I realize it's a more complicated debate to have going forward, but I'm not really prepared to, to have it now. We don't have time for it. Um, but I, I just feel like we have a very inflated sense about what could happen. And so as a consequence, well, let's just see if it does. And then the overwhelming majority of the time it doesn't. And in the process, people get hurt unnecessarily. I'm not really okay with that. Um, we have a school for refereeing. We have a school for judging. We have really, if you think about what fight camps are and, and gyms are, it's school, so to speak, for fighting. We don't have one for cornering. As I mentioned earlier in this, cornering is a separate skill. It's something unto itself. It's a different beast, and it has to be treated differently. When you're a coach in training, that's not exactly what you are once you get behind the cage or you know in front of the stool there, and you're giving tactical and strategic advice that needs to be conferred in a situation of high stress and demand. Um, those are two different things. And in boxing, they actually, I don't know that they have schools for this either necessarily, but they have a better tradition because in boxing, when there's that gap between fighters where six rounds in, you know, you're just not making any progress and there's no reason to believe you can make progress because they have less upsets, they just call it a day. So they have a better natural culture that has developed and of course they hand it down uh, person to person. They also recognize that damage, there's a finite amount you can take at which point. Uh, there is, the effects are irreversible and the, uh, not only on your general wellness, but on your ability to perform. Um, we don't have that. There might be some kind of case to be made that we need some kind of school for cornering or some kind of professional development in that regard. Um, I mentioned before, we celebrate the dignity of taking a beating, but this is just valorizing nonsensical action. And then, um, I believe that with you've seen fighters like St. Pierre tap, but also I forget which fight it was. He told Greg Jackson that he had a tear in his groin or something. And Greg Jackson through basically just told him to ignore it and to push through. I'm okay with that. We didn't know how bad the damage was. Sometimes fighters can over or underestimate themselves. Um, but for me, coaching a fightering to continue as a cornerman who might be wavering is fine. And you might say, well, someone who says I'm done might waver after the fact, but I disagree. I think there needs to be almost like a safety word or some kind of line that is held sacred in the sport. Maybe it's I'm done. Maybe it's I'm out. Maybe I don't want it anymore. Again, we can have that discussion and that debate, but we all need to find a place where when someone says X or does X, it doesn't matter if they might regret it down the line. It doesn't matter if they would, uh, if a coach later on would have said, oh, we have a bond, you can't question that. It doesn't matter. Once you cross it, that's it. We don't have that. There is nothing sacred in MMA in terms of cornering. A fighter can literally say that I'm done, and people will say, well, it's debatable. How is that debatable? Well, they might change their opinion after the fact. It doesn't matter. There need to be safeguards and thresholds in fights in rounds and between them, that when certain behavior that is exhibited crosses it, it doesn't matter that, that they, they might live to regret it or they might not have dignity or these other manufactured concerns. In order to keep people from taking unnecessary damage, in order to keep people, if you're really concerned about health and safety, in order to really say, uh, we can do this the right way, there needs to be something. And maybe it's not, I'm done. Maybe you want to have a say, it's a different word or a different line. Fine. 
But what I am trying to impart upon you is we need to have some kind of mechanism where if somebody says or does something, whatever that agreed upon mechanism uh, is, that once they cross it, that's it. We don't have it. And as a consequence, people are going to get continuously and unnecessarily hurt. Let's also take a look very quickly, if we can, at the Kimura from Davi Hamosh. We're here at the three-minute mark. Let's go ahead and start it now. And you'll see he gets off that right hand, the double. He actually sort of like did a knee pound, then lifted him a little bit. And here he goes from half guard. You're going to see this half guard is, is nice and tight when it needs to be, and nice and mobile and heavy on top otherwise. So look right here. You can see, oop, oop, I went too far. Hang on, hang on. What did I do here? Let's go back here just a second. There we are. And you can see for a second here. He's going to have a cross face. He's going to go back and forth with the cross face to that. Uh, excuse me, when I say cross face, he, uh, let me correct that. He had a frame, and then he goes to the cross face. Apologies, I'm a little bit off here. He gets that. What does that do? You can see him looking at that left toe on the ground. That means his hips are driving in. He's sagging his weight, and he's got the cross face on there. He's always controlling the neck and the head. He sort of has the underhook there, uh, but Nick Hine has that nice frame on the neck, although his arm is being collapsed, so there's not exactly a whole lot he's doing with it, but it's better than nothing. Uh, but you can also notice that Nick Hine is turning away. That's because the weight is forcing him over like that. So let's go over. He lets it go, and now he's sort of wrapping the head and pulling him up a little bit, maybe going for an underhook. And Nick Hine does something kind of weird. He comes up here onto a base like that, and just to sort of push him back down. Maybe he was looking for, uh, Davi Hamish was... Some elbows, you know, maybe an opportunity for ground and pound, soften him up. Didn't want to just sort of jump right to jujitsu style passing. You know, take his time, be patient, right? There's a lot of patience shown. And you see Nick Hine, uh, or rather you see Davi Hamo sort of cross his legs underneath here. It looks like he's just trying to, trying to create a stable balance structure underneath, lets it go, right? Put in the elbow in there, looked, looked briefly for a crucifix. Let it go, flattens him out, flattens him out. Now look at that, Nick Hine now flat on his back, right? That's what you want in any scenario, but especially in this one. And he's going to push the head across. Pu pu put, you see him pushing the head across and then punching with the other side. That's real nice. Nick Hine tries to get up underneath him here, it looks like. But in so doing, he just sort of forgets. Go back here for a second. If you're Davi Hamos, you're like, oh, he just went right up under me. Okay, I'll just go back to that. So what does he do? He's going to grab that hand. And you see him again with that shoulder pressure, making him turn away, controlling the head and hips. He's going to push on this. It looks to me to make him feel like um, that he is trying to maybe set up some kind of submission with that arm. right? I'm going to push into it, but not the way he thinks. He's going to push it away, which is going to force Hein to push it back down. And that's when he's going to, by controlling his body, come over the head and then let it watch. And then the arm's going to go down. The head's going to come around here. I'll, I'll walk you through. So he's pushing into it. That's going to force Nick Hine to go the other way. He's got the cross face here. And then Nick Hine's trying to roll because he wants to get that underhook back, right? He's pushing away, almost like taunting him to go for the underhook, right? And then he steps, pushes the head over. And now Nick Hine realizes it's a bit too late. So he was giving him a, like, I'm going to push against you. You're going to push back. It's going to hold you in place. And when it holds you in place, that gives me enough time from a structural standpoint to come around uh, and do this. And he's going to pop his head through. And now he's on the other side of it. He's going to punch, right? And now he's just going to grab the wrist. Nick Hine knows he's in big trouble here. All right, let's go through this a little bit faster. And he's going to lock this up. He doesn't use his thumbs, it looks like, right? What you're supposed to is supposed to be this, not this. But it's Davi Hamo. She can do whatever he wants. Right? I think the MMA gloves cause a problem. So look at this scenario. You can see what he has. By the way, look at the shoulder and the hips of Davi Hamosh. They're all facing this way. He's not fa he's not laying on top of them. He's got live toes on that left leg of his at the top of the screen you see there. Um, and so the issue for uh, Davi Hamosh is that he's going to have a real hard time getting that hand out. You can do this if you're really tall because you can extend real far. But really to get this Kimura, you have to get it not only not only like... Here, like not only here, you have to get it behind the back. And if they're flat on their back, that can be really hard. You have to kind of pull them up and step over, which, as you can see, he can't at the current predicament. So here's what he decides to do. Hold on. All right, he's going to cinch up this Kimura even tighter. Gets a nice grip. So look at that. The left leg of Nick Hine is blocking it. He can't just push it around. And again, even if he got it to the mat, it's not just getting it to the mat. you got to get it behind the person. It can be hard unless you really have the right leverages. So here's what Davi Hamos does. 
I'm going to go back here real quickly, one second. I want to see where he's locked up underneath. Because that will def okay. So you see here, Nick Hine does not have the lockdown. If he had the lockdown at the top of the screen there on the right leg of Davi Hamosh, that would have prevented him from jumping. But it didn't. And because he has live toes on the other one, he can get the propulsion he needs to do this. He's going to lock this up. He's going to lean on his shoulder and he's going to jump out with his hips. Watch this all the way past. Here he is. Boom, commits to it, slides out, Nick Hine rolls, but I want you to keep in mind in that Kimura grip. That Kimura grip is one of the strongest grips, if not the strongest grip maybe in all of MMA and all of Nogi. And then Davi Hamosh, you're not going to get a good sense of it here. He has this grip, right? He's going to roll out. As Nick Hine comes up, you see this roll? right? Watch Nick Hine, he's going to come up. That movement right there that you see, just this, as he comes out, just that is going to, combine with the Kimura grip, is going to give Davi Hamosh the ability to plant his weight and then ricochet back into him like this. You'll see it better from a different angle a little bit later. Then he comes up on top, uses that to get up high. Let's go of the Kimura grip, and now he gets under. Let's go through this a little bit quicker. Right Here he is. Almost loses the back here, but he just has nice control of the back where he loses a hook, but was able to plant it and keep it there in space and then put it in right there at the bottom of the screen right when he needed to. So now he's got the back. He's up tight. He's got it nice and hooked underneath the, the body. Even if you wanted to cross your feet underneath, you couldn't get it because the other one's hooked. You can cross, If someone has like their feet crossed like this, you can actually put your legs on top of it and extend and it'll hurt them. But that's not in the position that he's in, so it does no good. And he looks like he's sagging off. Nick Hine tries to sag him. And watch, you see him, look, he has wrist control here, right? Look at Davi Hamosh, he has control of Nick Hine's wrist. Nick Hine tries to buck that and let him go, but he just uses it once he lets go to hook underneath the arm and stay right on top and then reestablishes it w once he lets it go. So you're not going to get Davi Hamosh off of your back. He's just way too good. And now Davi Hamosh has the body triangle and he has the body triangle with the foot in the air. Even to get out of this, you'd have to have it reversed, right? So Nick Hine is just in, in a very, 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 very bad spot. I want to go through this hand fighting sequence here just a little bit. He hooks to the outside. Now it's even worse because he can sort of elevate you and turn you in different directions that he wants. You're going to see he's, going to, he's just going to rip his right hand out as he goes left to right. Watch. He, the body's going to rotate. And as it does, as it rotates, he's going to pull the other hand out on the opposite side. So watch. He's going to turn him. Let's see. Wrist control, wrist control. Right? Punching them. As they go the other way, slides it underneath there, but it's on the chin. Not a whole lot of good, right? At least that's what Nick Hine thinks. Now you've got underneath a bit of a gable grip, right? He goes back to the hands, and as he's going to pull them across, let's see. Yep, turns him, and then once he opens this side, that gives him space to draw his elbow back like that. You see that? Right? You have to do it just right. You have to time it just right, and it's more than just having elbow space. There have to be other conditions with the hand fighting. But you'll notice he was on this hip. If I'm on this hip, I can't pull my hand out. So let me rotate him to this hip, and then he can draw it back like that. And now he can just grab his hand. He can push that hand off. And as he pushes that hand off, see that? Notice he didn't go to grab his own bicep first. Look at this. When he pulls the hand out, he goes to push the other hand off first. Right? He's going he's gonna to slide into position while pushing you out at the same time. He doesn't go to position and then try to recapture it as you fight it off. And then just slides the hand through. Now, he's on the side that where he could get reversed, but it doesn't really matter at this point. Look at that. That was brilliant from Davi Hamosh. So he's got this on the jaw, as you can quite clearly see. Nick Hine in real suffering there. And he's going to try and turn into it a little bit. Watch, before he taps, he's going to look at him. You can see him suffering. He's going to turn right there. And then Davi Hamosh just re... And then look at that. Watch Davi Hamosh's body just go like this when he comes back in. Using that core, using that arm, using those lats, man. Really having a day with it. 
right here. Here's Nick Hine struggling. Watch what happens when Nick Hine turns to Davi Hamosh. Nick Hine turns. Watch Davi Hamosh. And then squeezes one more time, man. And at that point, it's a wrap, son. Uh, real quickly, let's take a look at the uh, replay here. All right, so check this out. Beautiful double, right? Boom. I guess we could play this a little faster. Gets it, picks it up, drives through, right? Leaves his own feet to finish the double. All right, now here's what I was talking about before with the ricochet. Now watch, there's no lockdown. Look at the right foot, the one that's between the legs, of uh, the Davi Hamas right foot, between the legs of Nick Hine. He's using his left leg to create this momentum to push out. He's going to slide all the way through. Nick Hine's going to roll through, and that's going to create the ricochet effect. You see that? Ryan Hall did something similar the, uh, a couple, two times ago. He fought before the Gray Maynard fight. I forgot who he fought. One more time, look at this. This is why you need live toes, boys and girls. He pushes off. And goes hips past the head. See that? Keeps the Kimura grip. That's going to allow Nick Hine to roll up because there's nothing controlling him. But if I have that Kimura grip, you actually can't sit all the way up. But you can force up and then create an anchor for me to do that. Look at the body of Nick Hine here. You'll notice he sits up, but then he stops. He comes to a dead stop. Watch. Here comes Davi Hamosh past the head. Look at Nick Hine. Stops. Can't move. Can't move. Ricochet. Right? So don't look at Davi Hamosh. Just watch Nick Hine when I do this one more time. One more time. Just watch Nick Hine. Right? Oh, no one's controlling me. I'm going to sit up. But I got stopped. I got stopped. I got stopped. Boom. And then and then the Venus flytrap gets you. Pretty damn impressive by Davi Hamosh. And last but not least, we take a look at what's coming up in the week ahead. It is UFC Fight Night. What number is this? 129. Uh, Maya versus Usman, UFC Chile, UFC Santiago, really. Uh, in your main event, Demi and Maya taking on Kamaru Usman. Alexa Grasso versus Tatiana Suarez. Of course, this will be at the Movie Store Arena in Santiago, Chile. Jared Cannonier versus Dominic Reyes. Veronica Macedo versus Andrea Lee. Diego Rivas versus Guido Canetti. Vicente Luque versus Chad Laprise. Then you go to Fox Sports 2 for your preliminary card. Zach Cummings is back against Michelle Prezerich. Uh, Brandon Moreno versus Alexandre Pantoja, or is it Pantoja? I can't remember. I can't remember if he's Brazilian or not. I think he's Brazilian, so it would be Alexandre Pantoja. Uh, Poliana Botello, Botello, Siori Kondo versus Siori Kondo, Gabriel, Bene uh, Gabriel Benitez, Mowgli versus Umberto Bandanai, and then you go to Fight Pass, uh, Enrique Barzola versus Brandon Davis, Henry Briones versus Frankie Sainz, and then Claudio Puegas versus Felipe Silva. All right. Uh, what did I get right? What did I get wrong? What'd you like? What'd you hate? I'm sure for this one there'll be quite a bit. You can shoot me an email, lukethomasnews at gmail.com. And until then, thank you so much for watching. Enjoy the fights.